Hey everyone, welcome back to the Chain Reaction Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Shaughnessy, a co-founder at Delphi Digital, which is an independent research boutique providing institutional-grade analysis on the digital asset market. Visit DelphiDigital.io and add your email for our research alerts. A quick housekeeping item, this podcast is strictly informational and educational and is not investment advice or a solicitation to buy or sell any tokens or securities or to make any financial decisions. For full disclosures, please see the bottom of the show notes. With that out of the way, today I'm thrilled to have on Ajit Tripathi, a partner at Consensus focused on the solutions segment. Ajit originally caught my attention when I read his article in Coindesk titled RIP ICOs 2019 will be the year of enterprise blockchain tokens. So naturally, I wanted to have him on to discuss his views and what he's doing in the security token and enterprise token space. We already had a bunch of security token CEOs on the podcast, but my conversation with Ajit is novel since we cover how tokens will invade enterprises in full force, building liquid and efficient private markets through tokenization, the benefits to the various market participants, and so much more. With that, let's dive into the conversation. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Chain Reaction Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Shaughnessy. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Ajit Tripathi, a partner at Consensus, focused on the solutions segment, but I'll let him give us his overview. Ajit, welcome to the podcast. Uh, please tell us a bit about yourself. Thanks, Tom. So uh, I go by Chain Yoda on Twitter and Telegram. Uh, and uh, you know, I've been in the blockchain space for the last five years. Uh, currently, I uh, drive uh, a chunk of our financial services business development, corporate venturing, and strategy work at Consensus, uh, part of the Consensus Solutions team, which is our enterprise-focused uh, uh, you know, business unit. And we work with a number of uh, 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 customers, clients around the world to deliver solutions and also to drive some of our product development. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, I came across you with your Coindesk post, I think we should start with, where you, it's basically titled RIP ICOs 2019 will be the year of enterprise blockchain tokens. I mean, give us your overview on that, and what do you mean by enterprise blockchain tokens? Yeah, see, so tokens are you know, remarkably simple, and one of the things I said in that article is that uh, if you go back to how the internet really took off, you know, people talk a lot about TCP IP, uh, but what people forget uh, is this uh, remarkably simple thing called a web page, right? If you look at the web pages in the early days, they were just uh, a bunch of text. And, uh, uh, and, and once people realized that they could actually exchange a lot of information on the internet, uh, starting with text and then images and then video and then sound and so on, so, you know, then sound and video and so on, so on and so forth, uh, people realized that uh, there's a lot uh, uh, that there are, there are lots of things they could do. They could exchange value. They could exchange information. You know, they could find dates. They could uh, order food, and that led to the development of a lot of uh, interesting technologies, a whole uh, layer of networking, telecommunications, uh, application layer technologies that literally drove the growth of the internet. Uh, and without uh, the, the simple thing called the web page, we and I was part of some of that as well when working on the SS7 stack and telecommunication networks, we wouldn't have figured out that there was a need for all of those solutions and engineers tend to be remarkably innovative and you know we are good at solving problems as long as we can see them. So now with the tokens, we are dealing with the same sort of scenario where, you know, in the early days, which is 2017 and 2018, somebody came up with a, this, well, uh, the, the inception of Ethereum, somebody came up with this remarkably simple idea that uh, alongside a piece of data that represents something of value, you could actually also encode rules uh, that uh, essentially, you know, describe the behavior of that asset and therefore create a lot of, uh, in a complex uh, programmable uh, digital assets. That idea is just as simple and interesting and remarkable in its power as a web page, right? So basic ERC20 token is actually dramatically, is really simple. Now, so we are at the stage of the evolution of this new internet, uh, this peer-to-peer -peer stateless, stateful internet called the blockchain, where we are dealing with tokens that have in their very, very early stage. 
But once uh, you know the imagination of enterprises has been triggered, and uh, today I work with a lot of financial services clients who want to you know uh, create new marketplaces using tokenized assets, who want to uh, t- take existing assets and you know digitize them using the simple notion called a token, and then create a whole bunch of more far more efficient and interesting markets using digital assets uh, represented by tokens. So. Uh, being at the forefront of that and being so close to markets, uh, I have the. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's it's my view as per artic- that article that while tokens started out in the wild wild west of ICOs, now they're going to uh, transform how markets work, right? And uh, when I say markets, I just don't mean financial markets. Uh, I mean a whole bunch of assets. How assets are issued, digitized, exchanged. Uh, so, so uh, as these uh, tokens start to move into more and more areas of industry, we'll see a lot of different uh, businesses change how they operate and a lot of asset markets change how, how they work. That's super interesting. And Ajit, before we walk through the opportunity here, I just wanted to get your quick take. I mean, what is an example of an enterprise token just to set the stage? Is this basically what we've had with ICOs or is this different? Well, the technology is the same, right? And uh, if you look, uh, so let me take a bit of a detour. Uh, most of the innovation in blockchain has come from cryptocurrency, right? So people uh, generally have this uh, biased view. Or some, I mean, where people divide things up into enterprise and non-enterprise. So it's either enterprise or crypto. But if you really dive into the detail of how uh, this market is, or this technology has evolved, all of the innovation, literally down from Bitcoin all the way to tokenization, uh, and a lot of the underlying cryptography has happened in cryptocurrency uh, and has been created by in the wild, wild west. And it's later been adopted by enterprise, right? And that's literally what's happening. So for an example, I see, uh, I work with a number of clients who are essentially tokenizing commercial real estate, who are tokenizing a debt, who are tokenizing uh, loans, who are do- tokenizing private company shares. So you might have seen the shares post announcement where they said they're going to create a tokenized market for private company shares. Uh, we did a project in Singapore uh, called Cabridge, uh, where we are tokenizing uh, a, a sh- a shares as well. Uh, you, you know, we've done a, another project in France. Uh, for tokenized SME shares. So this stuff is really taking off. Got it. So just to sum up, I mean, do you consider an enterprise token basically just like a private equity firm tokenizing one of their illiquid holdings or would that be different? No. So uh, think about it this way, right? Uh, You need uh, most economic transactions are based on contracts between counterparties, right? So there needs to be now, those contracts are currently written on paper, but with blockchain and uh, smart contracts, more and more tokens will be implemented digitally. More and more contracts between counterparties will be implemented digitally, and uh, sooner or later, this uh, is a world will emerge where digitally written contracts, contracts in the form of, form of software, will be honored and by, by courts, by you know, institutions and so on and so forth. But today we are not there. Now, uh, uh, what needs to happen is that uh, the contracts or the tokens, right, assets that represent some value and the rules around them need to be governed or need to be backed by actual legal contracts. You see what I'm saying? So, so that in case there is a dispute, uh, so let's take the example of a simple private company share, right? So with listed stocks, there is a, there is a sophisticated infrastructure that actually works. So there is, uh, there are lots of regulations. There are rules governing the conduct of uh, you know various market participants. There is, uh, there are process, well-established processes in every country for issuing shares, for trading shares, for settling uh, shares against fiat, and so on and so forth. Now, none of that infrastructure currently exists in private markets. So it's uh, uh, the reason I'm so focused on uh, uh, I'm focusing this conversation on private markets to some extent is because for a lot of assets, uh, especially in you know private markets, so rather as opposed to let's say public markets, a lot of this legal and regulatory infrastructure doesn't necessarily exist. 
So a lot of transactions are, you know, governed by contracts between two parties. Let's say you and I could uh, have, you know, get into a, just about any contract. You could go to Uber and buy a block of shares uh, on a very bespoke contract that you sign with the board of directors of Uber. And then if you want to trade those, that, that asset called the Uber private share, you would actually need to get in, uh, sign another legal contract that transfers the rights and obligations to another counterparty. Now, it's really painful, right? So, so trading, issuing uh, assets in, in these markets uh, is extremely painful. But when it comes to tokens, you can essentially digitize just about any asset that has value. And as long as you can uh, essentially define the rules that govern the behavior of that asset, you can wrap them into a token. Uh, the reason private markets are so exciting is because you know these are very, very, very large markets. These are extremely inefficient, high friction markets. Uh, these are uh, regulated, uh, but the regulatory infrastructure around some of these assets is essentially, you know, run by lawyers and a lot of paper and fax machines. And now in 2019, we got to do better than that. Got it. So just to close out this thought here, because it is a little confusing at face value, but your explanation is helping a lot, obviously. Basically, what you guys are trying to do is tokenize smart contracts that basically convey all the rights and obligations of each party, and then this can be traded between different parties? Yes, that's a good way to put it, right? So, uh, so we took, uh, we're working on tokenizing legal contracts that represent financial assets. That's what, that's what I'm working on. Right? So we have tools. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you met uh, our open law team, then they have created some uh, really robust uh, and, and, and exciting tooling where we can essentially uh, generate data-driven contracts and then off the back of that turn those uh, create tokens that uh, refer back to the underlying legal pros, right? So because courts don't understand solidity, right? Courts understand the specific phrases, text, uh, and even industry bodies like uh, ISDA understand specific terms and clauses. So each of the markets today, asset markets today, has a legal structure around it, and it has its own legal language. So backing the tokens, which are essentially smart contracts, uh, they need to they need to be some underlying legal basis. And uh, most financial markets are built, are essentially infrastructure for creating and transferring rights and obligations through financial contracts, right? And with our technology, we can do that far more efficiently, much faster, far more reliably, and take out a lot of paperwork, take out armies of lawyers and auditors, and essentially take out a lot of cost in the system. And, 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 and you know who pays for all of that? You do. <laughs> Good point. So, you know, now that we have an understanding of, of what you guys are doing with enterprise tokens, I guess let's zoom back out to the opportunity here. You know, how do you view the size of the opportunity or the market you're targeting? If, if there's any metrics you could share as well, that would help. Yeah. So, uh, look, one of the words that's used too often in blockchain is trillion, right? I mean, it's... Uh, it's almost a meme now. If something isn't worth a trillion, then it's it's probably not blockchain. But in this case, uh, we're literally looking at trillions of dollars worth of value being exchanged. So private markets, and when, uh, when I talk about private markets, we're talking about you know private equity, we're talking about venture capital, uh, private debt, real estate, natural resources, infrastructure. All of these are over 5.8 trillion. Uh, in 2019 in, in assets under management by funds, right? So what that means is that uh, the, the, a very significant part of the world's GDP is not being traded on NASDAQ. It's not being traded on NYSC. It's being traded uh, OTC or between private equity funds. More and more companies are raising capital without going to without going through an IPO. If you looked at Uber and some of the other companies, they've stayed private a very long time, uh, right? So more and more uh, companies are raising uh, capital in private markets. And uh, by the way, enterprise tokens is a much broader area, but I'm going to focus on this part of the uh, the opportunity. So capital, uh, so the current capital markets, listed capital market, the public markets are very inefficient. And the reason they are so inefficient is because there is a significant amount of work regulators have had to do uh, to protect investors. 
and that creates a lot of uh, requirements and restrictions uh, requirements for issuers like companies find it really hard and expensive to raise capital and investors find it very hard to access some of the markets so you know part of the reason the ico has boomed so much is because small investors have been restricted from uh, participating in some of the hottest opportunities right so if you are a small guy you can't invest in private equity you can't invest in venture capital you can't literally invest in anything that actually generates outsized returns so ico's party boom because uh, there is a lot of demand amongst investors for private assets there's a lot of demand amongst the small guys to essentially take advantage of the big opportunities profitable opportunities in markets and now uh, where ico's missed out is in sort of having a sophisticated uh, investor protection uh, infrastructure right so I mean, people issued a lot of assets backed by white papers. Now, what we want to do is there is a huge market, right? So there is a huge market for all of these private assets for capital raise, which needs to be opened up to small investors. And how do you do that? Uh, and the way you, uh, we think we can do that is by, you know, uh, creating infrastructure, digital infrastructure that's a much lower cost, right? Doesn't involve a lot of lawyers, auditors, and paperwork. and therefore uh, reduces the cost of issuing these assets reduces the cost of trading these assets reduces the cost of servicing these assets and which means that you know product things processing things like corporate actions stock splits uh, new issues rights issues so a lot of complexity in markets can be uh, reduced by essentially digitizing to me this is the the most exciting end of fintech and uh, with with blockchain and tokens uh, we, we can make that happen that's interesting so you know just walking through your earlier example or just changing to a different company i mean what would a company like uber have to do to basically uh comply or or use what you're talking about do they need to like apply a wrapper to all of their entities that own you know private shares or or do they just redo their whole you know cap table with with what you're proposing i'm just trying to wonder how private companies to actually implement this so let's 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 take this in steps right in in the in the eventual future 10 years from now right i think what's going to happen is that companies will issue assets directly on the blockchain right so if that world doesn't look so different from icos if i'm going to raise capital i'm going to i'm not going to go through a lot of paperwork i'm not going to hire a bunch of lawyers i'll have standards templates you know and and then clearly well defined ways of doing things legal and regulatory framework i'm going to do an ico 10 years from now uber is going to do an ico and that's a bold claim right but today a lot of those uh, the surrounding regulatory framework doesn't exist so what are you going to do right so what you do is you have to work with some of the existing intermediaries right so you need uh, you, you need to be able to take a legal contract so what i would do is i would go to the uber board of directors right i would buy a block of uber shares i would uh, agree on a contract with the uber board of directors that uh, they can now relax the cap table restrictions by which i mean uh, they can essentially allow me to take that block of shares and sell it in a, to some, to other people uh and then what i would do is uh i would essentially you know there are many ways to do this i could securitize that block of shares which means i put them in an spv and then issue shares against this uh this uh, this company called the spv or i could actually take uh you, you know which is what's also known so there is a securitization step there is a fractionalization step which is where you chunk all of the this block of uber shares into small buckets and then you essentially tokenize them so where each token uh, essentially represents a small fraction uh, or a claim on the underlying block of uber stock that now is is in this spv so today in today's markets i have to go through a lot of complexity as i'm just highlighting right to make sure that uh, the legal and regulatory uh, complexity is addressed and then i have to create a marketplace where these tokens can then be traded and then make sure there is all the listing agreements by the way uh, just a, just a bit of digression right uh, markets aren't about technology markets markets are run by lawyers so uh, most of the comp- so with with smart contracts and tokens we can take out a lot of that legal complexity uh, you know the legal complex complexity is there but by digitizing we can uh, essentially take out a lot of paper and inefficiency and then these tokens can be traded on uh, you know uh, uh, like coinbase they can be traded on a more of a regulated exchange like the london stock exchange or they can be traded on a dex 
So what's really happening is that uh, we, with public blockchains, we build the infrastructure that's far out in the future. Uh, then we realize that it's a little bit too early. So now we are essentially going into the legacy markets, looking at all of the legal and regulatory frameworks that uh, and technology that those markets are built on. And then from the inside out, we're trying to bring those markets back into the digital age. Got it. Yeah, I love your point on, on lawyers running the world. It's always been my view that, you know, people run the world and focus on people. So going into the issues or the challenges of private markets, I think the legal issues you brought up are probably the most important beyond just the operational aspects and liquidity and, and things like that. How often do you get questions of, you know, this will only be available to accredited investors or, or things like that? Because I think one of the goals with tokenizing private shares would be to open it up to everybody, not just credit. Absolutely. I mean, for us, right, and Joe has spoken about this in a lot of detail, for us, the vision has always been about democratizing access to capital and assets, right, and to the best opportunities to everybody. Now, if you think about why some of these assets are restricted, right, uh, so regulators don't restrict them because they want the rich guys to stay rich. The regulators impose uh, uh, these restrictions to protect the small investors, right? Uh, In private markets, there isn't a lot of disclosure. You're not not really required to publish annual reports. You're not even required to get an auditor and uh, audit all of your financial statements. There uh, there is limited recourse in terms of what you can or cannot do if uh, some of the information is wrong, right? Unless it's intentionally wrong. Uh, so uh, small investors can't really access these markets because the risks are high and the returns are high because the risks are high, right? So, uh, but if we fractionalize some of these assets and the grandma can invest small amounts instead of, let's say, large amounts, right? So then, then, then some of the suitability issues tend to go away, which is, uh, or at least become far less important. As in, if grandma is investing $100,000, that's a big problem. If grandma wants to put in $10 into a crowdfunding private equity deal, then uh, or $100 or $1,000, that's a whole other proposition. Right? So I think we took, and, and the, the question is, why do you need a token for that? You can do that today. Now, the, the, so there are two or three issues. One, it's not going to create standard infrastructure, right? Uh, so tokens are also standardizing how assets are digitized and issued. The second issue is that uh, everybody is going to create a different piece of technology and then eventually you know, it, it, that will limit the scale of the kind of market infrastructure you can create. Right? So let's say there are 10 market operators. Each one of them has their own uh, piece of technology. They don't talk to each other. Then we end up with the same problem we have today. Right, so so the technology is a big part of the puzzle. It also reduces some of the issues around suitability and risks for small investors. And by the way, the SEC chairman spoke about it. Right, so the, the regulators around the world are considering opening access to private markets to smaller investors. We just need to create infrastructure that uh, makes it easier uh, f- uh, for companies to disclose information, for investors to find the right price, the right assets that they want to buy. And then also invest small amounts. Uh, and the reason that's not possible today is the, because the markets are really high friction and really expensive to issue trade and uh, custody assets. It's a great call, Rajit. And you know, I've spoken to a lot of banks, and you know, a lot of the major banks' issues with getting involved with crypto is you know the IB the I, investment bank side wants to know you know where are we making money from this next quarter. It seems to me from your conversation that basically the bank could kind of get involved in blockchain and crypto through the tokenization and potentially the sale of these private you know, listings or equities, whatever we're going to call them. Do you think that this enterprise token drive will better link banks on Wall Street and, and firms, or do you think that it's more digressive? Oh, I, I, I think it will, right? And uh, uh... So look, standardization and market infrastructure didn't start yesterday, right? So it's been going on with uh, things like the FIX protocol, uh, Bloomberg terminals, uh, reference data standards, uh, standards for legal entity identifiers. So in order, to, uh, so, so tokens by themselves don't solve the problem, right? Uh, in order to create a market, fundamentally what you need is buyers and sellers. Now, today's markets are really fragmented because, uh, you know, the markets st- still haven't gotten onto the internet, right? So we have some very large monopolies 
uh, very large intermediate areas that uh, have to be protected uh, because the system needs to be held together. And those intermediaries have gotten even larger after the last financial crisis as regulators started to rely more and more on certain centralized intermediaries. And that was the right thing to do at the time because, uh, you know, regulators wanted a certain a central point of monitoring. If something goes wrong, then we, you know, when Lehman died, uh, uh, London Clearinghouse may, played a big role in actually helping recover the economy. So more and more regulators have been driving investment banks uh, towards the standardization. You know, they've been driving towards central clearing, which means if you want, a, you know, more and more trades are going through central uh, clearing counterparties. Uh, so standardization has been going on, right? And with blockchain and tokens, we have uh, the opportunity to dis- digitize and standardize the markets that are currently not standardized. And guess what the best, uh, the biggest benefit of standardization is? If we all speak the same language, if we all use the same interfaces, if we all work with the same data standards, then we all understand what's going on, right? So then we know how to price assets, we know how to risk, calculate risk on these assets, you know how to monitor and run regulatory reporting. So uh, we have this opportunity to create standards for representing assets digitally that will allow not just large investment banks to make money. And by the way, I'm a capitalist, as you might have noticed. Uh, but also, so it's not a zero-sum game. Consumers will benefit because markets will be more open, more interconnected, more transparent. Regulators won't need to rely rely on thousands of pages of Excel reports. They would just be able to, you know, run analytics straight off the uh, the source. We'll have uh, more uh, clear asset identities, less issues around reference data. So every this is why people like me who worked in you know banking technology tend to be so passionate about this, is because we have suffered all of these problems day in day out, and uh, and standardization around internet based market infrastructure finally opens uh, the path to essentially removing all of the silos in markets, uh, you know removing a number of inefficiencies like a transparency frictional costs, compliance costs, uh, systemic risk issues. It's a very, very long list of things that we want to solve with this technology. Got it. So taking my earlier question a step further down to VCs, I mean, are you basically killing the VC at this point? Like, what is the benefit of venture capitalists oh, like beyond their network here? Because it sounds like what you're trying to do is just make it you know, easier and faster to access capital or to tokenize these private equities. Yeah. Private. I don't represent everybody's view at consensus, right? So for me, uh, being an expert myself, I think there is a role for experts in the society, right? So VCs that are good at picking deals, that are good at uh, identifying startups uh, that have potential uh, uh, at supporting startups to be successful, or private equity companies that are good at operational management and you know creating efficiencies and synergies and driving growth and success of the companies and making them better run will continue to flourish. I think what changes is, is that it uh, no longer needs to be a cabal or a club of the old boys. Uh, grandma can be in it. I think it's good for everybody. It's good for the best VCs to be able to access capital from more sources. Uh, it's good for you know, to be less dependent on certain you know uh, limited partners. It's great for uh, some of the PE houses who want to change how the space currently works, and it's great for grandma. So I don't think it's a zero sum game. It's not the rich guy versus poor guy. It's literally I think everybody wins. That that's a good point. So I mean, Lyft just had their listing, and I saw a lot of tweets that a lot of people were mad that you know Lyft software was taking advantage of workers because they had no upside in the company going public. And I'm just wondering, like, you know, what do they expect every Lyft driver to be an accredited investor or something? I mean, if basically, if they use, if Lyft use what you're talking about, do you think that there's a world where they would have been able to give all of their drivers tokens um, within the company itself? Yeah, so that world, uh, that's a far more exciting world than the one I'm talking about, right? So the world that you're talking about is is when uh, peer-to-peer businesses can be truly disintermediated, when you know, Uber or Lyft sort of be- become a, a mutualized cooperative of individuals as opposed to some guys who take a big cut in the middle from everybody and uh, benefit disproportionately of the labor of others, right? So that's the world you're talking about. The world I'm talking about is is, is far more narrow 
essentially allows you know let's say uh, uh, grandma to access to invest in 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 lift much earlier than she was able to in this case right so by the time grandma got to buying lift lift was way overpriced and then it uh, dropped well off after the listing if uh, in my world if uh, uh, private equity and venture capital were open to grandma she would have gotten much earlier and she would have had the same returns as uh, the rich guy at Goldman Sachs. That's a good point. So, you know, I've had on, shameless plug here, I've had on a lot of the security token CEOs and founders, you know, Trevor at Polymath, uh, I've had Josh at Harbor, Carlos at Securitize, Mason at Tokensoft, et cetera, et cetera. You know, a lot of the security token CEOs and founders, a lot of the conversation is based on real world assets like real estate or gold, stuff like that. What you're talking about, I think, is more about the real enterprise and private side of things. Do you think this sets yourself apart? Because personally, I think there's just way too many STO companies out there. Uh, So, look, I don't see these words as different, right? So I I think... uh, as I as I clarified earlier, uh, in the long horizon, right? In the long horizon, I think more and more and more companies will uh, issue assets directly on chain without a lot of paperwork backing it. There'll be uh, uh, there'll be you know sophisticated legal and regulatory frameworks that recognize these tokens as uh, as as tradable assets uh, and so on. So so the regulators uh, have to come up. Uh, to speed with the technology and become more comfortable with it. We have a lot of work to do on, uh, you know, the underlying stack in terms of scalability, resilience, and so on, and that's happening at light speed. Uh, but, but, uh, uh, but that, you know, where the opportunity... So the STO platforms are going to happen, right? Uh, let, me, let me explain why. So when you look at listed markets, let's say you trade shares on NASDAQ, right? There is a well-defined legal framework for uh, issuance of public shares and trading of public shares. So, you know, there is a thing, uh, there is an entity called TTCC, which dematerializes. So once upon a time, they used to be stock certificates. Now people don't email stock certificates to each other. Those stock certificates are dematerialized inside DTCC. And DTCC essentially does, uh, uh, makes database entries to, if, to essentially move assets around. Right in in plain English, so that didn't exist before 1973. Uh, it, it took regulators uh, some time to get comfortable with this digital world, but there was a clear need for it. And today we live in a world where the current public infrastructure is not exactly working, which is driving a lot of assets into private markets. Right. So and the regulators are familiar with it, uh, and and sooner or later that world needs to move to the internet. And that's what we call STOs, right? That's what we call STOs, where uh, everything is digital first, assets are issued digital first, capital raises are is, are digital first, trading is digital first. We're not there yet. We still live in a legal paper-based world. So when I say enterprise tokens, right? So this movement is happening in, in two directions. One is this digital first world of ICOs and STOs. And then there is enterprises and intermediaries starting to look at this technology and saying, wow, this creates huge opportunities for us. And at some point, these things start to combine in the middle. And we see this interconnected internet-based infrastructure for financial and non-financial assets being issued, custodied, traded, which, and these, these works aren't going to be different. STOs, are, you know, ICOs were ahead of their time. Uh, the surrounding frameworks, the legal and regulatory frameworks didn't quite understand them. Uh, some of the investor protections weren't there. STOs are slightly ahead of their time, but the, the time has come. And and at some point, the enterprise tokens that I'm talking about and this whole, uh, you know, the world of internet-based uh, assets will, will merge. And all of these markets, all of the platforms for issuance, trading, custody will be connected with each other and therefore, there will be a lot more transparency. There will be a lot more, you know, fewer silos, far fewer costs. Uh, we literally, so when I say enterprise tokens, I'm talking about take, uh, taking these legacy market infrastructure into the internet age, right? But it's happening in two different dimensions, if it's confusing. No, no, that, that makes sense. And the only thing I wanted to hit on, though, I mean, you, you're part of consensus and you guys have so many projects. I'm wondering whether that's like whether that hurts or helps. I'm, I'm erring on the side that it kind of helps in comparison to other SEO companies because you guys have like Helena, you know, which is research and more kind of voting at this point, and you have 
you know, other companies like AirSwap and you have Token Foundry and Trustology and, and all your infrastructure services like Kaleido. Um, you know, I don't mean to pump consensus there. I'm just kind of pointing out kind of the other components that you can work with that other SEO companies don't have. You know, how much do these other components play into your advantage here or do they not? Massively, right? So but t- let's, let's, start from, uh, let's start from the purpose of consensus. Now, you know, you've spoken to Joe. Uh, Joe has a very broad long-term vision. Uh, you know, Joe is uh, uh, not just trying to change capital markets. Uh, you, know, you know, Joe is literally, uh, uh, and I, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of Joe, but Joe is literally trying to change how the internet works and how the economies work. So that is a very broad, uh, big vision. And within that, you know, we have, uh, so our uh, approach has always been to build things from the ground up. So we were we working on the protocol layer with Pantheon. We are working on the blockchain as a service infrastructure layer with Kaleido. We're building a number of tools and components like Trustology for security management and custody. We're building Adhara for tokenizing fiat and collateral. Uh, you know, we're building a number of exchanges like AirSwap and, uh, uh, you know, new interesting models like DutchX. Uh, so, yes, we have lots of different uh, components. But there is uh, there is a, there is a, there is a method to it, and the method is that uh, you, you know we don't know exactly what uh, customers are going to need. So the same technologies and tools are being used uh, today in trade finance. The same technologies and tools are being used for uh, digitizing working capital assets like invoices and tables. Uh, the same technology and tools uh, are being used for digitizing financial contracts, like you know, open law is particularly exciting in that space. Uh, th- then, so we don't. Exa- so we we always had a, a from the ground up component based uh, approach to you know creating tools and components. We created Truffle, which really helped the Ethereum ecosystem grow. So we are literally going in working meticulously at each layer of this stack of what we think is going to be the internet based uh, stack of uh, you know ex- creating and exchanging value uh, and not just within one economy but cross border in in a global asset market right so uh, the, 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 we're trying to build the the vision is a little bit you know, might think it's a bit crazy but we're literally trying to build the the web3 substrate of the future uh, internet-based economies, and uh, that takes a lot of work within uh, within consensus. In spite of our the breadth of things we pursue, there are very very focused people, right? So I focus exclusively on financial markets. There are people who focus exclusively on key management. There are people who focus exclusively on STOs. There are people who focus exclusively on utility tokens. So we are uh, we might appear to be doing a lot of different things, but the reason we are able to do those is because we are. Uh, you know, very focused people inside a, a team that does a lot of different interesting things. Got it. And just to close out kind of the examples and what we're talking about, I mean, the Lyft example I gave earlier, I think a lot of people have kind of heard of that example, but going more on your side with the smart contract side to round out the conversation, would that would a good example of that be, you know, let's say, you know, I'm, I'm a co-founder at Delphi Digital. Like, let's say I had a token that represented a smart contract where, you know, I would deliver one podcast a week to Delphi Digital to send out, and I could transfer that right and say compensation to somebody else. Is that kind of what you mean by enterprise tokens at a really basic level? Um, So yes and no, right? So the technology is the same. And that's part of the power of it, right? So whether um, with Ethereum, one of the big advantages is that your source code or your code remains the same irrespective of whether you're using the public uh, permissionless network or you're using an enterprise private or consortium network. Your code is literally the same, right? What changes is the deployment, uh, the configuration, the tools and controls you have to put around the deployment uh, and so on. So if you're Delphi Digital and you want to raise capital, uh, right, or then you could do that in the ICO market. I would, uh, you know, do it carefully if I were you. You could do it in the STO market in the right jurisdiction, or you could actually go to a broker dealer uh, and say, hey, I want to raise, uh, do an IPO or something similar. 
but I don't want to, you know, uh, uh, go through the, uh, uh, the the cost and uh, and pain of registration and so on and so forth. But I actually want to follow the law, right? Then you would say, all right, let me try and work with a crowdfunding platform because the, the amount of capital I'm raising is not as large as Lyft, right? And uh, it's too expensive for me to access uh, NASDAQ or, you know, London Stock Exchange. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise 5, 10 million uh, uh, through a crowdfunding platform because I want to keep my costs low, right? As a startup, as a small business, I want to access markets, but I actually want to do it far more cheaply than I would if I were to lift, you know? Uh, so, so this is literally about democratizing markets on both ends, right? For small issuers, for entrepreneurs, uh, for people who are trying to build small, interesting, uh, focused businesses, and also for a grandma who actually wants to, you know, uh, uh, do a targeted search, invest in the things she believes in or things that it, she finds exciting. So I, I use grandma's example a lot because to me that's literally, you know, the, the investor that I want to serve, and, uh, and 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 that's literally the play because. Uh, the markets fail a lot of people today and we want markets to be accessible to a lot more people, both issuers and investors. Got it. So, Ajit, you know, how far away are we from this? Is this next year, 10 years, 20 years from now? I know your post kind of said 2019 would be the year of enterprise tokens. I'm just wondering your timeline. Yeah, so uh, I think by the time I retire, which is in 18 years, we'll have changed everything. Uh, it's, it's a hockey stick. You know, it's, 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 it's an exponentially rising curve. So... Uh, this year, I would say we'll be able to digitize 0.01% of all assets at best, right? Probably you can add one more zero to it uh, after the decimal. Uh, but then uh, there is a this thing grows on a, on a log scale. As in uh, every year from then, we're going to see uh, the number of uh, tokenized assets grow by a factor of 10. Uh, so let's say, you know, we, we're looking at uh, uh, $5.8 trillion in private markets, uh, and I'm focusing on a very narrow, narrow uh, you know, segment of the total assets in the world, uh, the, the space I understand. And if we, uh, this year we'll probably have uh, assets worth uh, $58 billion, between five and $5.8 to $58 billion digitized using tokens, and then that thing goes up by a factor of 10 every year. So in maybe five years, we'll be looking at a large chunk of this market digitized on the optimistic side. And if, if I'm off by a factor of 10, I think we would have changed the world. Got it. So I'm always wondering what the effect is for STOs and enterprise type tokens here on the actual blockchain itself. It's It's kind of my working thesis that STOs do nothing for like let's say the value of a blockchain and do more for you know reducing the illiquidity premium and, and other operational things of the real world assets themselves that are tokenized. Do you think that um, if you're successful that enterprise tokens would add value to the Ethereum ecosystem or do you basically think it would do more just for the assets themselves? So uh, look, the, the goal isn't so much to, at least for me, the goal isn't so much to maximize the value of the blockchain, right? It's to use the blockchain to, to for people to do well i mean and that's something joe has held uh, very close to his heart and you know he's spoken in public about it and and with a very consistent message so we want to create a, we want to essentially fulfill the dream that bitcoin started with which is to create you know a better financial system a more open, more transparent, more efficient financial system because th that's what lies at the heart of economies, right? That's what uh, underlying all of that is the legal and regulatory framework. So, which is why we, if you look at the work we're doing with open law, the work we're doing with, you know, digitizing legal contracts for making dispute resolution processes uh, digitized on, on Ethereum. So, Ethereum is a tool, right? So, Ethereum is not the end in itself. Uh, uh, with, with, with Ethereum and the, the technology that we're building with Ethereum, uh, we can make so many different things so much better. And uh, especially in financial markets, I think, uh, and, and within that, when in, in private markets, which don't work so well, uh, whether it's crowdfunding, PE, venture capital, private debt, and so on and so forth, it's, it's the logical place to go after. 
right? Because uh, uh, this is where we start to change the financial system uh, properly, which is what I think everyone in crypto wants to do. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, Ajit, before I let you go, it's been a great conversation. Is there anything we missed or did you want to head on? Right. So I, I think, look, uh, I tried to cover a, a complex topic, uh, right? And uh, with, with lots of different dimensions. Uh, what I would say is that uh, you know, people see this artificial dichotomy between enterprise and crypto or STOs and enterprise tokens. It's not real. Right, these are labels. I and mean, at the end of the day, the vision, the goal for everybody is to create a, a more efficient, a more transparent, a better managed, a less uh, a financial infrastructure, a global cross-border connected financial infrastructure with less risk that serves customers better. That doesn't eat away half my pension. You know, it doesn't cause, it doesn't fail grandma and, and foreclose her house unnecessarily. So uh, at the end of the day, it's grandma that needs to be served. And uh, the, the good news on that is that it's not grandma versus Goldman Sachs. I think everybody wins if you do this right. And that's literally the power of this technology. That's awesome. Well, Ajit, where could people follow you on Twitter or Medium or, or learn more about what you're building? Uh, uh, I would say they should go to the consensus website, uh, uh, look at uh, some of work around you know, consensus digital securities, uh, Trustology, Adhara, uh, my favorite uh, platform called Open Law and Kaleido. And uh, they can follow me on uh, Twitter on uh, my handle, Chain Yoda. Uh, it's Chain Yoda. It's kind of funny. It combines Star Wars and blockchain. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we should uh, continue speaking. No, I love the handle. Well, Ajit, thanks so much for your time. It's a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the podcast, please rate and review it so other people can find it. 